My sermon passage is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil, my cup, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Please pray with me one more time. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we are walking, we are walking in the valley of the shadow of death. Alton Sterling in Louisiana. Philando Castile in Minnesota and five police officers in Texas walked into the valley of death and didn't make it out. We walk in their shadows. God help us. Some of us were in the shadows within minutes of their deaths. I myself saw Diamond Reynolds' video with her bleeding, dying boyfriend lying next to her less than an hour after she first posted it on Facebook. I saw one of the Dallas officers shot down within the hour. I wasn't looking for it. That's how social media works. Facebook and Twitter brought the shadow of death, the shadow of these deaths to my house, to my eyes, to my heart. Within minutes. God help us. The Pointer Institute a journalism think tank says, Facebook Live came of age this week in the same way that radio did in World War II, TV did when John Kennedy was shot, and cable TV did during the first Gulf War. Our world was changed this week. And God help us. White people especially, more of us, to see that what some of us did not want to acknowledge is true. The new media is revealing these kinds of minority citizen deaths, not creating them, but the new media also is creating new death to reveal from ISIS to Dallas. God help us, all people, to keep coming together despite the din of voices that would shout us down that would shout down cries for justice and for repentance and for healing. Black Lives Matter is a terrorist group, Rush Limbaugh said Friday. Black Lives Matter is a farce, Sarah Palin said Saturday. God shut their mouths. We can't. We can only try to outshout them. God protect Black Lives Matter at Bricktown this evening. God help them. And God help us. We are messed up. And maybe that's the first point of agreement. The first stage of mutual repentance and renewal. We're so messed up. America is broken. <coughs> Spike Lee tweeted Friday. America is driving toward the abyss and it's time we hit the brakes was the headline on the story on the conservative National Review website. So can we agree on this? We're messed up. Maybe it's a start. May it be. We have been more divided in the 1860s and in the 1960s. But an infection is in us all. 
fear, barely beneath the surface. The fear of unprovoked violence that black folks have always lived with is getting on some white folks now. Let it be so. Let it be more so, but let that fear mature into need. And let it cause more of us to come together and walk through these long shadows of death together. Together, fearing no evil. A friend of mine, a black woman in Kansas, wrote Thursday. My first call of the day was from my son, expressing his anxiety about being safe. You don't know him, but he's a big guy. and might be termed scary by some who hold what to me seem unreasonable stereotypes, but they still hold them. To me, he's just Brian, a musical theater major who works in IT, who loves to sing and would give you the shirt off his back, and he's my son. His call was not surprising with the shootings in Louisiana and Minnesota. He feels that he could be doing nothing, and still he is at risk. Gay and a person of color, biracial, and in, the many, and in the eyes of many, he's African-American. Talk about feeling vulnerable, she said. Another friend of mine, a white man in Arkansas, wrote Friday, I'm a police officer. I've been one for almost 30 years. I'm angry and hurt. My heart is swollen with compassion and empathy and concern for my blue brothers and sisters in Texas. I want to reach out yet feel so helpless to comfort them. Not one time in my career ever had I gone to work thinking, I think I want to kill a minority today. Never. I don't know any other police officers who have expressed such a desire, nor would I have tolerated it if I did. There most assuredly exists systemic racism. Most of us alive today were born into that. Most of us recognize it and are working to fix it. No one should be mistreated because of circumstances of birth. But that foul, rotting murderer in Dallas, he went out last night with an avowed hatred in his heart explicitly to target police officers, white police officers especially. He said so. Let all honest voices be heard. May all ears be open to one another's truth. May we fall under one another's Shadows of death. What images come to mind when you hear or read the 23rd Psalm? Carefree sheep, a cool water stream, a green meadow, but then a lowering storm cloud being watched by a careful shepherd. It is a soothing image. That's why the 23rd Psalm is so familiar and so popular. But the picture of peace only resonates because of the danger. The 23rd Psalm is a beautiful metaphor, but it's about real life, real sweaty, gritty, dangerous life. Happy times and sad, fat times and lean. The Psalm is about real, fragile life lived in faith and the care of our shepherd. And for us as the body of Christ, that means, or it should mean, in the care of one another. This metaphor has teeth. God is with us no matter what. Period. No matter what's happening or could happen to our bodies, with our relationships, with our communities, or the world. The Lord is our shepherd, not the police, not any government. Not any religion or church, not any political party, not any philosophy, not the marketplace, not the marketplace for self-defense and security products, and especially not the marketplace for guns. None of that is our Lord. But the Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai, who is love, who we know in Christ and in one another, in one another. Trinity Presbyterian has been an example of racial reconciliation since its first days of existence in 1960. That's our legacy, it's our future, and we are sorely needed now. For you visitors, this church came about in 1960 with the official and former merger of a black Presbyterian church and a white Presbyterian church. 
It was the first, if not the only, formally integrated church in 1960. Think about that time. We cannot take this holy place for granted. We cannot take ourselves for granted. May we get our teeth back. May we get the word out anew. And by we, I mean me, and you, and you, and you, I mean us. By ones and by twos, by the score and more, we have a word from the Lord and we need to get it out. We are all of us in this thing together. God and those who came before have shown us the way we must take it. The 23rd Psalm can be a map. The 23rd Psalm can bring us to our senses. It can help restore us to ourselves in community. It can cast out fear. In fact, some scholars think that it dates to the return of the Israelites to Jerusalem and to their rebuilt temple after long oppression and captivity in Babylon. That's the origin of the prayer in the 23rd Psalm. It was a medicine for them then. Let it be medicine for us. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd is an old and common metaphor for royalty, including David, the shepherd boy, and shepherd king. It might have a ring to it. Jesus is Lord, the earliest Christians said, not caring if it provoked Rome. Jesus, who said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, not the empire, not the government. I shall not want is radical stuff. It means I lack nothing. Well, who does the psalm writer think God is enough? The psalmist declares God is enough. God is love. Love is all you need. And that got into the New Testament. I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, underlined and bolded, and God's righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. That's Jesus talking in Matthew 6. That doesn't mean we get a buy when it comes to trouble. It means we can live life fearlessly, but we should do so shrewdly. And that's another sheep reference. See, Jesus says in Matthew 10, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Verse 2, he leads me beside still waters. Still waters as opposed to wildly rushing waters. <clears throat> still water, sheep can drink. Turbulent water, they can't. And water is life. Turbulent life, we can't find relief. Still peaceful life under God and with one another, we can. Verse 3, he restores my soul. A better way to put that from the Hebrew language is he restores my whole self. My mind, heart, spirit, and body. So really the best way to put it is our shepherd, our God, who is love, restores me. God, God's love keeps me alive. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. He leads me. The sheep is following its shepherd. The Hebrew means something closer to God leads me as a helpless one. In other words, as one who has to trust God and rely on God. What else have we got? Verse 4, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God is with us especially in our deepest, darkest despair. That's a promise. Verse 5, God prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Somebody who knows sheep better than I do pointed out that they almost always eat in the presence of their enemies. Sheep are safe only when they're with a trustworthy shepherd held together. That's why it's so critical to find the lost ones. 
as they're in danger. That's why loners in Christ, that's why loners in Christ, if there can be such things, are in danger on their own. That's why we must come together and keep coming together. <clears throat> and that naturally, that naturally leads to verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Shall follow me sounds nice. <laughs> follow me. Like a little sheep dog puppy. And it is a nice soothing hymn. When I walk through the dark lonesome valley, my Savior will walk with me there. And safely his great hand will lead me to the mansions he's gone to prepare. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. You know this song. All the days, all the days of my life. Do you know what? It's not nice like a little puppy. It's more like a full-grown German Shepherd teeth bared. We have domesticated the 23rd Psalm like so much else of the Bible. We've pulled its teeth. We've made it another Hallmark card by letting it become so familiar and comfortable. Here's something that might change the way you read it or hear it. Maybe it'll change the way you think of God's promise of care and love for us. It really changed mine when I first learned this. And it has to do with the words mercy and follow. The Hebrew word behind mercy is chesed. Sometimes it's translated as steadfast love or loving kindness or just love. There's not just one word in English that gets the full meaning across. But what chesed means is something like fiercely protective and possessive love, like a mother bear protecting her cubs. In fact, that's how the prophet Hosea describes God's love, as a mother bear protecting her cubs. And that fierce, protective, and possessive love is the love of God in the 23rd Psalm. That word follows not that nice either. God's fiercely protective and possessive love doesn't just follow behind us, waiting to catch us if we fall. The Hebrew word means pursue, like a soldier chasing an enemy. It means to track like a hunter. It means to hound like a bloodhound. It means to dog. God's love does dog us. Fiercely and protectively and possessively. We can't shake it. It won't go away if we just if we get worried. And it won't vanish when we fall into fear, because it's God's own faithfulness that keeps us, not ours. Thank God. It's God's faithfulness that keeps us, not our faithfulness. The green pastures and still waters in which we imagine ourselves as God's beloved people are not just the stuff of peaceful scenes and children's Bibles and beautiful hymns. It's the safe zone in a war. The 23rd Psalm is lovely in its description of God's love, but we need the fired up zone. And for that, we need a prophet. From Ezekiel chapter 34, hear now the prophet speaking for God. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. I will feed them on the mountains by the watercourses I will feed them with good pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land. I myself, God Almighty says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak but the fat and the strong I will destroy. And that sounds real extreme. But we have this on good authority. The first shall be last, and the last will be first. The strong shall be made weak, and the weak shall be made strong. That's the love of God. That's the love of God that follows us, that hounds us, that dogs us through all of our life. 
That's the unfailing love of God that dogs me. God haunts me. May the Holy One haunt you. May God and God's love haunt and help us all as we lean on one another in these shadows of death. Amen.